Well, let's let's go ahead and get started. The room is quickly filling up. Um, thank you again for coming back. We've got two great sessions left in the day. Um, I've been really looking forward to hearing um, from our next presenter, uh, Thomas Apt. He's the director of the National Commission on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice, um, and they're kind of overseen or sanctioned by the Council of Criminal Justice. Um, uh, Thomas has a very diverse and extensive background with criminal justice field. And in addition to being featured in several major media outlets um, for all of his work, um, he's also a respected author uh, of a book called a Bleeding Out, The Devastating Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets. And uh, just so you know, I asked Thomas if he wouldn't mind putting the link to his book in our chat room, which he did. Um, but I think after you, you hear from Thomas, you're, you're probably going to be interested in, in learning more about him and all the things that he that he does. And uh, so without further ado, Thomas, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to you and, uh, and your entire audience. Uh, I think I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't uh, uh, acknowledge my, my former colleague, Acting Commissioner Anthony Annucci, who's in the audience today. Much of what I learned about, uh, what, much of what I know about uh, corrections, I learned from him. Uh, but today we're going to be talking uh, about uh, a subject that has been on all of our minds. It's impacted everyone, both personally and professionally, and that's uh, the impact of COVID-19. And so that's the subject uh, that I'm going to discuss with you today. And so I'm going to share my screen at this point. Uh, if I could get some thumbs up to let me know that, in fact, you can see this. Okay, people are seeing the screen. That's great. So uh, as we begin, first I wanna talk a bit about uh, the Council on Criminal Justice. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Council of Criminal Justice and uh, it was a, it's a new organization and it was launched in July of 2019. And it's an invitational membership organization and also a think tank. And the goal uh, for the council is to really serve as a nonpartisan, Center of Gravity for Policy and Leadership in the Criminal Justice Field. Uh, our goal is to advance understanding of criminal justice policy uh, choices uh, through nonpartisan uh, research and through task forces. And so I'm going to talk to you about our task force, uh, uh, the National Commission on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice. I'm the director of this uh, commission. Uh, this commission was launched in uh, July of 2020 with the support of a number of uh, philanthropic organizations. Uh, we are led by former Attorneys General uh, Loretta Lynch and Alberto Gonzalez, and we have a diverse set of leaders, uh, 12 or so, um, from policing, courts, corrections, community-based academia, community-based organizations, academia, and public health as well. Um, all, all different political persuasions, lots of different perspectives, but everyone quite knowledgeable on the criminal justice system. Here are some of our members. You can see we have former police chiefs. We have the former attorneys general. We have a big city mayor. We have a public health expert uh, from Johns Hopkins University. We have a sheriff. We also have uh, uh, prominent activists and advocates. We have a well-respected academic. Uh, and also uh, we have the courts represented with a judge, a prosecutor and a, a, a national defender. And of course, uh, wouldn't the commission couldn't be complete without uh, a corrections leader, uh, which we uh, were luck, very fortunate to have uh, Colette Peters uh, join us. So that's, uh, that's who the, uh, the commission is. Now, what, are, what is our mission? What are we supposed to do? Our charge is first to assess the impact of COVID-19 in the criminal justice system. Second, our, we, are to, we were to develop priority prevention strategies to minimize the impact of a resurgence uh, of COVID-19 or future pandemics, sort of immediate steps for action. But then finally, uh, we were charged with establishing a priority agenda for policy practice and research a sort of forward-looking look at the entire criminal justice system uh, in a post-pandemic world. And we looked at the all, all sort of four sectors of the criminal justice system, which we call the four Cs, cops, courts, corrections, and community-based organizations. And to my knowledge, uh, the commission is the 
first sort of uh, body of this level of sort of status and prestige to ever recognize community-based organizations as an almost co-equal branch of the criminal justice system. But our, our leaders believe that, that was important to do. So what, what have we accomplished to date? Well, we have extensively documented uh, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the criminal justice system. We've issued 16 in, uh, uh, impact reports to date, uh, in, which is, is given that we started a little more than six months ago, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. We've covered things like crime trends, jail case, and, uh, jail case rates and deaths, prison case rates and deaths, uh, DV trends, substance use disorder trends, racial disparities, and of course, public health. We also released interim recommendations uh, early on, on October 1st, detailing concrete steps that criminal justice leaders across the system, policing, courts, and corrections could take immediately to stop the spread of COVID-19. And I urge you to look at those, that report, it's in the chat. Um, we also, uh, in December, released our final recommendations. And these recommendations uh, were really uh, looking again, uh, forward-looking at the lessons learned uh, for how the criminal justice can, system can be better in a post-pandemic world. And I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time uh, discussing those recommendations. So, but first let's talk about the interim report. And I just wanna uh, go briefly through some of the key recommendations here. First, uh, we urged criminal justice leaders, and if you can sort of uh, put yourselves back in the position you were in in the late summer, uh, early fall, we urged criminal justice leaders uh, in corrections and elsewhere to stop ex exponential growth by exceeding official guidance in order to contain the spread of COVID-19. So we asked criminal justice leaders to take a look at what the what WHO said, the CDC said, uh, other uh, public or health organizations were saying, and to use those recommendations and guidance as a floor, not a ceiling. One of the things that we stressed is that it was extremely important uh, to, uh, to get ahead of the virus and to be proactive. As, as you all know, the virus does not spread in a linear fashion, it, it spreads in an exponential fashion. But, so by the time you're detecting a surge, it's often already too late uh, to contain it quickly. We uh, came out early and aggressively in support of universal masking requirements for all uh, staff and justice involved populations when indoors. We also ind uh, endorsed wide and frequent uh, testing for both staff and justice involved populations. We felt it was very uh, important to go beyond symptomatic testing uh, to some form of mass testing in order to, again, get those early warning signals so you can get ahead of the virus. And uh, one thing that we really noticed is that um, and we're actually doing some research right now on state correctional systems. And what we're seeing, just looking across all correctional systems is we're seeing a fairly significant correlation, and it's just a correlation, but a correlation between the number of tests that a correction system does and the number of deaths that the system does. And so, uh, so generally speaking, we're seeing that the correction systems that test more seem to be able to use that information to uh, lower their death rates and prevent more uh, and save more lives. In addition, we, uh, we recommended a variety of concrete uh, things to do to limit contact, maximize distance, and reduce density within the criminal justice system. This is, of course, most important in congregate settings like jails and prisons, but it was true, ev uh, true everywhere. So we've, uh, we recommended that police make arrests only when necessary to protect public safety. We uh, recommended the reduction of in-person court appearances. Uh, the reduction of uh, admissions and the uh, increasing of releases to reduce density in jails and prisons, and to activate and engage community-based organizations to help criminal justice agencies do all of these things. One of the things that we've seen is when CBOs uh, are, are um, healthy and, uh, and, and viable, they can serve as a much sort of uh, much valued sort of force multiplier 
when a criminal justice system has to quickly decarcerate. And then finally, uh, given the disproportionate impacts within the criminal justice system and the disproportionate impact of the pandemic itself, we urge leaders to actively engage and consider impacted voices in all decision making. So that's a bit about the interim report. Obviously, it went much deeper than that. It's, uh, it's uh, well over 20, 20 pages. It's chock full of lots of information and more concrete steps. And in fact, there's a section within it uh, that is specific only to correction. So if you wanted a cheat sheet, you could go right there. Um, so now I'll move on to the final report. And the final report was really based on sort of five major findings and recommendations that then flowed from each of those findings. Um, I don't think any of these findings will surprise any of you, but really the point of, of the National Commission was to sort of synthesize all of the existing facts and evidence um, and filter it through a sort of prestigious um, high level body uh, to really sort of get out sort of a, a sort of set of consensus findings and recommendations. Not that necessarily sort of knocked everybody's socks off because they were so innovative, but just to say, hey, here are the things that we should all be able to agree on and move forward on regardless of where we are uh, politically or in the system or, or different perspectives. So first, not surprisingly, uh, the commission uh, found the criminal just, justice, agency, justice agencies simply were not sufficiently prepared for a large scale public health crisis like the coronavirus pandemic. Um, all of your agencies uh, engage in some form of emergency planning. Uh, we, all, we all have done this uh, in the past. This is part of, part of uh, what we do. However, uh, few if any agencies really anticipated an extended disruption of operations for not just for days or weeks, but going on for months. And in fact, now we're almost to a year. And so, you know, no one anticipated uh, uh, this or, or if they did, they anticipated it really only superficially. Uh, and so in response, based on that finding, uh, not surprisingly, we believe that we need to engage all sectors of the criminal justice system. Again, those four C's including public health authorities and community-based organizations, and get involved in integrated crisis response plans, plans that are linking all of those different sectors together. Because as we know, one of the things that the pandemic has shown us is that uh, we are more connected uh, for better or for worse than ever before. Um, in addition, uh, we, uh, we recommended establishing new structures like standing coordinating panels for public health emergency preparedness. You know, creating some official mechanism to meet regularly and discuss regularly how to stay, uh, stay prepared and to get the right people around the table. Namely, we need a lot more interactions with public health authorities uh, here in the criminal justice system. Um, and also building up community-based capacity to support justice-involved populations. If we need to quickly decarcerate, uh, often those individuals uh, for, the, uh, for themselves and for the needs of public safety are gonna need additional services. Uh, and so how do, we get those, uh, how do we get those supports to them? Uh, things like that. We also attracted some attention because we came out strong and recommended prioritizing not only those working within the system for early access to vaccines and PPE, but also those incarcerated within the system. That was based uh, simply on the public health information that we were receiving at the time and the common sense notion that according to public health guidance, uh, you need to prioritize vaccines where the need is greatest. The CDC has said this, other public health authorities have said this, and the need is greatest in congregate settings. Congregate settings include nursing homes, they include uh, cruise ships and other things, but of course they also include um, uh, correctional facilities. And so we believed that we weren't elevating uh, correctional facilities, both staff and populations, but we were simply including them in the category that they should naturally be according to the public health criteria. Here's a bit of data uh, uh, that one of uh, that we commissioned from Ann Harvey out of uh, NYU, 
And this is just a, something looking at uh, jail populations and lo local COVID-19 case counts. This is for 319 jails uh, in, in counties all across the United States, a fairly large sample. And what you can see uh, in the blue line is the total jail population and then the COVID-19 rolling seven day average. And so what you can see here is that in March at the outset of the pandemic, specifically at the outset of the uh, declaration of a national emergency, you see this very significant drop in jail populations. But then around May, you see those populations slowly starting to creep back up. And the interesting thing is, uh, is that this is not responsive to where uh, COVID-19 case rates are. So as COVID-19 case as case rates are rising or as they're falling, it doesn't matter, the jail, uh, the jail population just uh, continues to keep rising. And this really relates to our second finding and recommendation. We believe that the scale and scope of the criminal justice system, just the sheer size of the system, along with the absence of public health coordination, pose a real obstacle to controlling COVID-19. And so commissioners felt across the board that we needed to rebalance criminal justice and public health responses, again, in order to limit contact, maximize distance, and reduce density. And in the report, we de detail some very concrete ways to do this, such as expanding emergency release mechanisms to permit the medically vulnerable to petition for release, um, investing in public health alternatives to tr traditional law enforcement, trying to get those who are simply drug addicted, mentally ill, or maybe even chronically homeless, um, out of criminal justice hands and into the hands of public health providers, and to ensure adequate access to behavioral health treatment, um, adequate medical care, and stable housing for those returning from incarceration. Uh, this is a graph that's basically showing, uh, this is a, a chart showing the sort of, uh, sort of top performers and I, I don't want to say worst performers, but uh, according to state systems, according to some data provided to us by economist Kevin Schnepple. And what you see on top, what you're seeing here are uh, um, fractions of COVID-19 cases. So the light blue thing up there, if you look at South Dakota in particular, that's showing that the, uh, there are 5% of confirmed COVID-19 cases, somewhere between 5 and 10% as a, uh, as a fraction of the state population. But then on the other side, in comparison, you're seeing that uh, the uh, fraction of the prison population uh, as, a, as a fraction of the confirmed population is well over 50%. I'm not sure if I've articulated, uh, articulated that well, but what, what it's suggesting is we're trying to, at the same time, look at the, uh, look at the rates in the, in the community and the rates in the, in the prison at the same time. And one of the things that you can see here is, and we're, you know, we're taking out all of the states in the middle here, is that there's a wide disparity. So you've got states that have very high rates of COVID-19 uh, in, in, uh, in prison, and you have states with very low rates. You have many states with uh, you know, less, than, less than 10 or even zero confirmed deaths uh, within the, within the uh, prison system and states that have uh, far, far too many. And so this leads us to our second, this, this graph is really just intended to illustrate this point. The commission discovered a tremendous amount of variation and in fact inconsistency among criminal justice agencies in terms of their response to the pandemic. And the sheer diversity of all these responses was a real obstacle um, to a national response. And so in response, the commission encouraged the adoption of shared standards and best practices for responding to these situations. And so getting sort of some, some sort of standard rules uh, of practice uh, in the, you know, uh, on the books so that people all sort of could act in a more coordinated and more consistent function. In policing, this uh, included issuing citations in, in lieu of arrests when public safety wasn't uh, jeopardized. You know, methodically identifying which court proceedings are absolutely necessary in person and which aren't. 
and then mandating national basic standards for correctional healthcare operations and developing strategies to ensure compliance. Now, as all of you know, there are standards, uh, standard, uh, st standard setting bodies uh, out there in terms of correctional healthcare, but there's really no mandatory uh, uh, function there. And there's no sort of uh, function there to ensure compliance. And that's something that the commissioners uh, believe uh, uh, would improve the system. Moving on, uh, we found, uh, this is also not surprising, that criminal justice agencies were slowed by a lack of data. Uh, we found the commission itself uh, and myself and the research team uh, found this itself is there were a lot of questions that we wanted to answer that we couldn't answer. And we couldn't because we simply didn't have the data. And so the recommendation from the commissioners was to collect and transparently report standardized aggregate public health data concerning uh, justice involved populations and staff. Uh, now this in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, sort of COVID-19 and other pandemics, we need to uh, report out on case rates, testing rates, positivity rates, hospitalization rates, and of course, mortality rates. It's very important to not only do this, but to also do this by age, gender, race, and ethnicity, so that we can identify differences there and uh, identify disparities if, if they exist. And it's not just about data, it's also about being transparent about changes in practice uh, and being very transparent about what you're doing, when you're doing it and why, uh, and sort of communicating both with staff, with justice involved populations and with the public at large about what you're doing. And that can be, you know, as any of us who have you know, all of you are in leadership and positions and I've been in those positions in the past, it can be very difficult to be transparent because you're worried about exposing yourself to criticism, you're worried that people won't understand the proper context. But I think that the, all the commissioners believed that the best thing to do is just pull off the Band-Aid and engage, and engage transparently uh, with, uh, with the public, um, understanding that this is a pandemic. Uh, and of course, you know, it's easy to say we need more and better data, um, but it's hard to do. And federal, and so we recommended that federal research agencies should develop a new data architecture and fund a national research uh, agenda. It, you know, I, I, I understand and I think the commissioners understand that, uh, you know, capturing, recording, and then releasing data is a time, uh, energy, and cost, uh, you know, co cost-consuming process. And so we believe that there's a federal role in providing additional resources in this area. Uh, we want more, we want, want more data, but resources have to be made available in order to do that. It can't just be a sort of resource-free ask. And then finally, um, you know. We heard again and again about a lack of communication and transparency. This is related to, but not the same as the last recommendation. Uh, and we believe that you know you can't simply just call for more communication. You have to really build uh, that communication by developing reliable channels of communication in between crises. And so we recommended things like establishing liaisons in criminal justice facilities to facilitate the flow of information creating additional channels of communication between correctional facilities, people in custody, their families and counsel, and engaging with community-based organizations that are often better positioned than government organizations to communicate with the most disconnected populations. Um, and so, you know, that's, that is, uh, so stepping back, sort of those are our overall um, uh, findings. And I think, you know, one of the things that I'd like to sort of note is that um, through its sort of very intensive examination, uh, the commission did not sort of discover a, a silver bullet or a single strategy or a set of strategies that uh, were the solution to the coronavirus pandemic. And really what we found uh, looking across all of these systems and across all of these jurisdictions was a, you know, ultimately somewhat of a common sense finding, which was that ultimately which jurisdictions performed better than others was really determined more by perspiration 
than by inspiration. The best performing jurisdictions took this seriously right away. Uh, they took action right away. Um, they, uh, and, and they were pro, proactive and they remained vigilant. They didn't let up uh, as uh, case rates or death rates might have temporarily diminished. And so, you know, it was in, in many ways, uh, you know, the responses to the pandemic really uh, really just reinforced the lessons that we already knew about the criminal justice system more generally. But what we hope is that ultimately the criminal justice system will emerge from this uh, pandemic uh, smarter and wiser and uh, more focused on its connections with community-based organizations and with public health organizations and more integrated um, as a result, understanding that all these different parts of the puzzle um, ultimately fit together. And so with that, uh, I'll stop and uh, take any questions. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, just, to, I guess, just a real quick, uh, not necessarily a, con or a question, but a comment, Thomas, is, like, is first off, thank you for, for sharing your report and findings um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this without it sounding like I'm, I'm pushing back on you too much, but, but it's just, it feels very raw still to, to me that, um, in the first, you know, three or four months, five months of the pandemic, there were so many people that were screaming to the, the, the rooftops that, you know, the corrections is not doing enough, that the, you know, leaders aren't doing enough that these correctional directors are going to be overseeing morgues in every single state. And, and as you look across the, the United States, absolutely, there are, um, A, there's areas where we can all improve. Um, but there's also, there's also, like, there was some pretty amazing things happening. And I know a lot of amazing work happening within our correctional leaders across the United States. And, I'm just wondering if, if through your report and like research, did you, did you come across that as well? Did you come across to find and it's like, man, here's an agency that's not even resourced under good times um, and significantly under-resourced during a pandemic. And yet they still through innovation and hard work were able to you know, manage this thing. Did you, did you come across any of those types of things? And if so, um, sure. worth you know talking about. So absolutely, and you know, we came across success stories as well as uh, not so successful stories. But we also sort of made an effort not to identify by name um, failures, and so uh, we didn't. Uh, we were also sort of constrained uh, to identify uh, those particular jurisdictions and to sort of draw the lessons about why they were successful, uh, except for this sort of this sort of overall diligence finding. Um, we did. We do believe that, particularly for correctional facilities, that you know an aggressive testing regimen uh, is is important. I don't want to. I don't want to be over overly negative. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, the commission's job was sort of to make recommendations for for improvement. And you know, COVID uh, COVID nineteen case rates are roughly five times what they are in prisons than they are in the community. And they're, the death rates when you adjust for race uh, and age and gender are roughly twice what they are in the community. Now, I think it's an interesting question as to whether that's, uh, you label that a success or a failure. Given the enormous challenges that correctional facilities are facing, you could very well characterize that as a success. Um, and so uh, I think that, you know, Kevin, your, your point is well taken, but I would say, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in and out of the criminal justice system and leadership positions. And, you know, we have to have broad shoulders and we have to have thick skin. You know, uh, unfortunately, uh, people are mostly going to pay attention to our failures. Uh, but, uh, but I take your point. Yeah, nope, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. Okay, good. Thank you for allowing me to say that let's let's look at um let's look at the group any uh looks like helen hans hanks you have a, a question helen hans here <laughs> thanks thanks <laughs> kevin uh i was uh, very interested in understanding uh how you use the cdc's recommendations as they 
really produced them throughout the pandemic a little late for corrections and detention facilities and examine that in coordination with the report of the commission. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit more candid here uh, than I was, than we were on, on the page. Uh, we were uh, a bipartisan commission with Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and so I think some of us felt uh, less comfortable uh, critiquing the federal agency response uh, than others. But I think in this position, I think we just have to acknowledge candidly that the, uh, the federal response was lacking in, in many regards and that the guidance uh, came too late. It was often uh, conflicting. It was often evolving. Um, some of that can't be avoided in a public health crisis. Uh, but I think that, you know, one of the things that we sort of were saying subtly was you need to go beyond the limited guidance that the federal government was, uh, uh, was issuing. Good. Thank you. Alan, did, okay, I, good. I, I mean, I, I would completely agree with you as a agency. I love my state being at the bottom of your chart, uh, but they didn't provide guidance right away. And so many of us who have sort of the healthcare influenza experience, that's the first thing we went to. But uh, I, I was again curious how you, you know, they've changed their iteration numerous times. You have to essentially just check every day to see if they've changed something. Yeah, and I and you know, and I think I think there's an implicit criticism here uh, when you have a you know dramatic, you know, for those of us who have looked at this at multiple levels, if you have a uh, an extremely diverse response within the state, you've got to ask whether the state leadership is you know exercising enough leadership to sort of get people on the same page. Same thing goes with the federal leadership with the states. So I think it's a I think it's a fair uh, fair point, Helen. Yeah, and Thomas, that's a great point too. We saw early on uh, governors who quickly put their criminal justice leaders, like a correction director, on uh, a task force. You know, sitting around that table and starting to talk about this. I mean, you could see where you know, they were just more successful because they were getting just firsthand information about this thing, as opposed to those that kept them at arm's length and hoped this thing was going to go away. So I think that's a really good point. Uh, thank you, Helen. Great question. Um, anyone else? Anyone else want to put up a virtual hand? Um, have a question, Tony. So, Thomas, good to see you again. I, I can honestly say, uh, in all these years, you haven't lost a step. But uh, <laughs> great presentation, and I think you know your points were well taken. I think all of us in corrections have learned a long time ago that public safety, public protection is inexorably intertwined with public health. We're all dealing with mentally ill cohorts. We're all dealing with people that now require medication assisted treatment. So we're into that world. We in New York State learned firsthand that we were not prepared at all for when the AIDS epidemic struck in the mid eighties. And it was like a tsunami for us in corrections. We had to get our act together significantly. Then we had to deal with tuberculosis and airborne disease, the disease. So fortunately, we had built up our infrastructure. And even so, this was still a huge challenge for all of us. What I think um, all of us in this business have experienced, we all know that there is a huge advocacy community out there that is very much intertwined with uh, anti-mass uh, incarceration. So a lot of them have used this as an opportunity to push for their agenda. They called it public health, but they basically were constantly, you know, uh, submitting letters and petitions to the governor, to corrections. This is a human tragedy waiting to happen. You're being irresponsible. And they were supported by certain elements in the media. And anytime there was somebody you know, somebody in the system that put out any claim like they didn't get soap or they didn't get disinfected, they printed that like it was gospel truth. So we were really fighting, trying to do the best we can, trying to make changes on the fly and up against an advocacy community that really, honestly, they were less than, than, than honest with their criticisms and their feedback. So it was a huge political challenge that all of us face, we continue to face. And yes, you're right. We want to do the best we can with public health, 
we're in bed with them, we follow their advice, we're vaccinating, we're testing, we're changing, we're always evolving in, in this area. But to not recognize that the advocacy, some elements of the advocacy community out there really saw this as an opportunity that they were not going to squander. That needs to be part of the discussion of this. Uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, Tony. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that you know this is not true. Just this is true not just in corrections, but obviously in policing and elsewhere. And there's it's a real difficult balance in uh, as, when you're in a leadership position where uh, you have to be you know you have to be open to criticism, but you also want that criticism to be fair and you know to be perfectly clear. There are now sort of, you know, journalists whose paycheck is entirely, you know, dependent on, you know, routinely criticizing the criminal justice system and these things. Ultimately, I think we will be better, uh, better for this. But I do think that we need to hold uh, organizations um, and the media accountable for, for being accurate. And also, you know, I, I personally, uh, sort of draw the line between uh, reform and abolition. So I am a very strong proponent of reform and I'm happy to engage in a discussion with anybody about the proper pace of reform. Uh, but I don't think that, I, I, I think that the sort of abolition conversation is, is just not a productive one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in you know, today's society, there's a, a deep need for you know, cops, courts, and corrections, and we're not leaving that world anytime soon. Thank you. John Baldwin, associate from Iowa and Illinois. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, my question, my issue is, in the 70s, when I was a social worker driving to then called the mental retardation institutions, bringing people out dropping them off in the community for the community to take care of them, that failed. And, and, and as Tony said, during the, during the AIDS epidemic, we reached out to public health and they weren't very helpful. And then the hep C stuff and on and on and on. My question to you is, you reference a lot community health and I believe in community health totally they don't necessarily believe in corrections totally. How are you going to help corrections overcome years and years of promises, but not fulfilling them? And I, I will tell you, a lot of those people I dropped off as a social worker, I saw in prison 10 years later. And the community health talk a good game and have done some wonderful work outside of corrections. How are you going to help corrections bridge the community health gap of knowledge, risk, security, and understanding that the people who come to us need exponentially greater attention than those who might walk in off of the street? Thank you. Uh, John, it's a great question. It's, it's a huge question, I, you know, not, not, not an easy one to answer. I guess I would say the first thing is, I think we need to uh, put ourselves in the criminal justice system in regular and routine contact with public health authorities. These are, these are thorny issues that won't get resolved in one conversation. They have to be, we have to sort of insist that we're all gonna play together. And over time, we can work these issues out. And I do think you make a very good point, which is, um, many in the media, media are quick to point out the overcriminalization of mental illness, of, of drug addiction, and other things. But what they don't sort of pay attention to is that the criminal justice system did not ask to become wards of these people. They became wards of, the, uh, of these people because of the failures of other systems. And uh, you know, couldn't couldn't agree with you more about the end of mental health facilities and the alleged transition to community care that was supposed to happen in the 70s. So uh, great point. I, I also just wanna, Kevin, if you don't mind, uh, leave, leave a moment for uh, my friend and colleague, Colette Peters, who was on the commission to say a few words if she has anything, you know, if I've gotten anything wrong, Colette, please jump in. 
Thomas, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for presenting today. Uh, no, I don't think you got anything wrong. Uh, what, what a great presentation. It was an honor to work with you um, on this very important project. And I think, um, you know, to Kevin's comments in the beginning, uh, I think it is acceptable to say that we really are proud of our response to this and we're not satisfied. The post-op on this is going to be incredibly important for whatever else the world is going to send our way, be it a natural disaster or another pandemic. Um, we were with building the airplane kind of as it was taking off. And so really, uh, really appreciate the commission's ability to help guide us in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so appreci appreciative that you didn't wait until afterwards and you helped us kind of find the parts to that airplane. I think that's really important. I think uh, to the comments around those advocates, we sure learned who our friends were and who our friends weren't in 2020. Uh, that is, there's no doubt about that. Um, and, and I think they are trying to, many are trying to leverage this moment in time to push public safety reform. I think there are many people around this table um, who philosophically want to push public safety reform like I do myself. And I think one of the things that we can all acknowledge is that we have engaged in mass contact in this criminal justice system. And if we can leverage this moment in time to help undo some of that, I, I think we would be lost if we didn't. To Mr. Baldwin's point, so great to see you, John. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. We have to do this right. What I am seeing in Oregon and what we saw while working on this commission is this pandemic has built a bridge between corrections and public health. And it, it was a bridge we were forced to build in the midst of all of this. But I really hope that in Oregon and across this country, we keep those bridges really strong because I think there are partnerships that we can create with public health that go long beyond this pandemic. Um, and those relationships should continue to be built as we move forward um, because incarceration is a public health issue. And I think if we can um, continue that dialogue, it would be uh, phenomenal. I, I'm actually wondering, and I'll, I'll look to, to uh, Kevin, I wonder if it's time to bring uh, public health officials to a CLA meeting like we've done with other, um, uh, other interests in the past. Um, so maybe that's something for the board to consider um, to help build that bridge nationally. So thank you, Thomas. Great to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Awesome job, Thomas. I'm going to kick it over to you for final words. Um, great presentation, great feedback and comments from folks. Uh, Thomas, any closing comments? Uh, you know, I don't think I don't think I have any uh, great words of wisdom aside from what the uh, the commissioners, uh, you know, carefully put together. Uh, I think that uh, I think that the work uh, of criminal justice leaders in this moment is perhaps harder than it's ever been, but uh, also um, extremely important. And so I guess I would just say uh, from one person uh, who used to be on the inside but is out, but is currently on the outside, uh, I'm very grateful to you and to your leadership. So thank you. Great job, Thomas. Excellent job. And uh, Colette, you said it perfectly. You said it the way I wish I would have said it proud but not satisfied. I think that is a great description of, of where we are. Very proud of the, of the hard work that our correctional leaders did, um, but certainly not satisfied. I would encourage you each to get into that chat room and, and pull up the link to the report that Thomas uh, talked about and referenced. There are some great recommendations in there as he just talked about. Um, I really appreciate the diversity that's on the council. Um, I, you know, whoever, whoever was behind choosing um, the, the commissioners of that uh, Council of Criminal Justice did a great job of, of just having just a great diverse mix of corrections, law enforcement, and, and just, it was awesome. So really good stuff, Thomas. Thank you very much for your presentation.